Welcome to Dweller of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influence many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers today. Comment below if you like. If you have authors that you'd like to see recognized, list them in the comments or contact our author page. Subscribe for more tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten. We'll have quite a collection climbing out of the tombs. If you like any of our tales, hit the like button below. You can find us on Facebook under Jeffrey LeBlanc Horror Writer, official website JeffreyLeBlanc.com, listed on Amazon, and we're also listed on Twitter. Night Owl Hotep was written by H.P. Lovecraft in 1920. It is a prose poem that first saw publication that year's November issue of the United Amateur. Desperation, darkness, and defiance define the poem. Night Owl Hotep point paints a hopeless view of human civilization in decline and explores the crawling chaos within a dying society. Lovecraft wrote Nadia Hotep from a dream. While he was still half asleep, Lovecraft wrote the first body paragraph of the Dark Poem. This is the first appearance of Nadia Hotep in the Cthulhu mythos. This evil harbinger of certain doom plays a prominent role in several of H.P. Lovecraft stories. Lovecraft always characterized Nadia Hotep as a nightmare. The poem proceeds to describe the appearance of Nadia Hotep as a man of the race of ancient pharaohs who claims to have been dormant for the past 27 centuries and his subsequent travels from city to city demonstrating his supernatural powers. Who is Nadia Hotep? What does his appearance mean? How will anyone stop this evil force from overpowering a dying city? Nadia Hotep by H.P. Lovecraft Nadia Hotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last. I will tell the audit void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger. A danger widespread and all-embracing. Such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demonic alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world and perhaps the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nalyal Hotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellaheen knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of 27 centuries and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilizations came Nayar Hotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nayar Hotep and shuddered. And where Nayar Hotep went, rest vanished. For the small hours were rent with the screams of a nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pity and moon as it glimmered on green waters, gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Nadia Hotep came to my city. The great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, 
and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings. That what was thrown on a screen in that darkened room prophesied things none but Nayarhotep dared prophecy, and that in the sputter of the sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which shewed only in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nayarhotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with restless crowds to see Nayarhotep Hotep, through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room. And shadowed on a screen, I saw hooded forms amidst ruins and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments. And I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end, while shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity. Nayarhotep drove us all out, down the dizzying stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive. And when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious and voluntary formations and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to shoot where the tramways had run. And again we saw a tram car, lonely, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split into narrow columns, each of which draw seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filled, filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country and presently felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn. For as we stalked out of the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf of the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight, as if beckoned by those who had gone before. I have floated between the titanic snowdrifts quivering and afraid into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sent here, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the world's vague ghost of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spears of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the unmuffled, maddening beating of drums and thin monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping whereunto dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, 
Tenebrious, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargles, whose soul is Nalya Hotep. Thank you for listening. Have a good night.